Okay, I think uh, I think we can start. So welcome everybody to the AVM series. And uh, today we have Anthony's uh, Soika from Czech Republic. So Anthony did uh, his studies, his undergrad and the PhD in, uh, in Czech Republic in the and particularly in the group of uh, Peter Neugebauer at the uh, Central European Institute of Technology in Brno. And there he started uh, working on a high frequency EPR, on instruments in high frequency EPR. But then since a little bit more than a year, he has moved to UC Santa Barbara, where he increased the frequency, I guess, and for sure the power, still working on instrumentation, but uh, with a free electron laser. And today he will tell, uh, tell us a bit more about the development of uh, frequency agile uh, EPR powered by a free electron laser. So thanks for uh, for uh, talking in this series and yeah, the floor is yours. Wow, thank you, Thomas. So hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Thomas said, my name is Anthony Soika and I'm doing currently my second year of postdoc at UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm working under Professor Mark Sherwin and I'm trying to develop a new, ver new generation of frequency agile Electron spin resonator, resonance spectrometer, powered by free electron laser. Uh, because, just okay now. Because this uh, presentation is a bit longer than twenty five minutes, let's say, I put here some content. So in this presentation, I would like to speak about why we actually want to use free electron laser as the source for electron spin resonance, and this is not new. It was already built in two thousand twelve. It was a uh, spectrometer operating in 240 gigahertz. Uh, so I would like to refer to it and uh, introduce it because a lot of technology what we currently developing coming from this old spectrometer. And in the second half of my presentation, I will mostly focusing on this nice render here like on our new electron spin resonate, resonance spectrometer because it's still under current, uh, it's still under development. But we already developed some uh, key component of it and make publication from it. So I will speak about them. So why we need a high power electron spin resonance non spectrometer, and why we want to use free electron laser as the source? Free electron laser is huge. For those of you who doesn't know, it, it, this is the picture of inside the valve. It's in the valve because it can emit radiation, and it is huge. And you can maybe not even like realize how huge it is until I will show you the scheme of our lab. So this is our lab. Here is the UCSB free electron laser, and this is a human for the scale. And big advantage of it, of course, it was give us kilowatt of power on broad frequency range. And this actually can get act for us, get access for short-lived excitation, especially subterrane frequencies, because if we compare it uh, the pulse length, which required for the spin echo detection to low power source, it can get access to much short relaxation. And this also opening us the door to study new phenomena, which here at UCSB are like, uh, interesting in here, I place the graph on frequency to magnetic field to show the phenomena we are interesting in, and also you can see here the well-known spectrometer. So there are like Brooker Hyper, which operating most of the Brooker spectrometer operating under 100 gigahertz. But in the last decades, there is of course more and more spectrometer going above 100 gigahertz to operate in high magnetic field and frequency. And there is also this our old spectrometer to 140 gigahertz. A field powered EPR spectrometer. And the new one, what I'm now developing, should cover like much broader frequency range. It should go up to 5 gigahertz, up to 16 Tesla. And this gives us access to the short relaxation study of quantum polarization again for dynamic nuclear polarization or extension of highly entangled spin system, which are well known for their short relaxation. But with this system, we can also aim to study optical address of molecular qubit where the zero field splitting is typically large and we need high frequency to probe it or antiferromagnetic spintronics. And this is all about like most application we are mostly uh, here, we are interested in. And you can already see that a lot of them are able to approach with 240 gigahertz FEO EPR spectrometer. So how that guy is working. Uh, let's take a look a little bit closer. It is a huge spectrometer, uh, which has uh, three main parts. FEL, pulse laser, and uh, EPR spectrometer itself. And because it's kind of complicated uh, 
engineering device, I will go part by part, part by part. So first of all, you CSB free recognizer. This uh, device is relatively old. First lasing is recorded in 1986, and its parameters and advantage mainly is in the power. So it can provide from one to 100 kilowatts power over the huge frequency range. We are speaking about starting frequency at 170 gigahertz, going up to 4.5 terahertz. On the other, sen other side, the downside of the spectrometer that the repetition rate is around one hertz and output uh, pulse is always one microsecond long. We cannot do the short. And how pre electron works uh, is like follow. So you have this huge tank, like cylinder, where you charge your electron and then you send them uh, through the vacuum uh, pipeline. Here it's visible here. In one point in pipeline, it will cross the undulator, which is a series of the magnet in a period, which start oscillate this electron beam, and the electron lose the energy and emit the it in the electromagnetic wave. You build a cavity around this undulator where you like charge its energy, and there is the like, silicon wafer. The silicon wafer uh, is almost transparent for this uh, uh, for certain frequency if you choose like uh, thickness correctly, and but if you can see, for example, we starting sending them the, the beam, the energy start charging the cavity, and then there is like here the uh, output uh, of the FEL. You can see here it's small rising power. So this is some front reflection from the silicon when the energy is charging. And then we can the silicon activate by green laser. What then happened that we create a lot of electron hole pairs and silicon, which is normally act like almost transparent, start to acting uh, like a mirror and we can like get rid of all the energy or like take all the energy from the cavity in the one almost 40 nanosecond pulse. So this is how a uh, free electron laser working our setup. And there is one more thing, what you can see here also on diagram, which is called injection locking system. This is actually a huge advantage, advantage of our system because what when we building uh, the energy in the cavity, there is not only one frequency, which is like uh, the energy is built on, but there is several modes of the cavity. But uh, it was like proof that if we send a small fraction of the power on one of these modes, these modes start to be dominant and consume most of the energy. And electron will more likely emit the, their like uh, energy on this mode. So we, if we inject lock, it means we seed it, we send a small fraction of the power before we, we lace. We can like get one very narrow bandwidth pulse of output. And I, I speaking about 0 0.5 megahertz narrow bandwidth pulse at 240 gigahertz, which is otherwise not so easy approachable. So this is first part of the old spectrometer. We have the nice pulse, but for most of the EPR experiment, you need at least two to measure T2 echo detection. With one pulse, you cannot do much. And even though you want to have control over its length, duration, and uh, other thing. And this is kind of complicated again, because you have high power pulse, and you need to process it. Takahashi in 2009 came with idea of pulse slicer, which he employed serious series of this uh, silicon wafer. And how it's working, I will try to like uh, explain it here. You have FEL out, uh, FEL output going here to pulse slicer, and when it hit first silicon, you uh, now the silicon is at Brewster angle to minimize this front uh, surface reflection. So this kind of spot here it should not be there. So it's normally passing through, right? Because it's not activated, it's acting like, like transparent. So then you activate it by green laser and you can transmit a uh, microwave to this op new optical path. So you, from this long pulse, you're creating like shorter pulse. And to have well determined also pulse length, you have the second silicon hidden in, in, in here back to back horn system. And when you activate that, you have very nice and narrow uh, pulse, which you determine by the activation of these two pulses. This system works great. Only downside is, uh, is it's a uh, kind of enormous. It's need two optical tables, over fifty optical elements component, and also three uh, very high power of you know, one hundred fifty milliards laser. Because how one pulse is created, it's created by one one of these laser. There is the beam splitter where the laser going to activate first silicon. Then by beam splitter is split the laser and going to activate the second silicon. So the pulse duration is actually determined by the optical delay path between the activation of first and second uh, silicon. 
Uh, just uh, there is also additional thing. I don't speak much about it, but uh, we can also because I explain you how to create one pause, but we can create in total two pauses with this pause slicer setup. And one of the pauses we can also do the phase shifting. This is very useful if you want to do uh, some short lift excitation stuff or you want to get rid of your FID and measure nice echo. Because when you change the phase of one of pause, you can then post process it and recognize what is FID and what is echo. So now let's take a look on the third part of this old spectrometer. So we have two pauses and now we want to do EPR measurement. And uh, for that, we have the send own like spectrometer, which is its own solid state source, like low power solid state source, and it's working in induction mode. For those of you who doesn't know how induction mode uh, working, uh, I will just mention here. So we're sending linearly polarized light through the wire grid. It's passing wire grid going to the magnet. Then it's reflected from the mirror under the sample and going back and passing wire grid again. Now, if there is no resonance and there is like no change of polarization, this microwave should go back in the same path, go back to the source. But if uh, there is the resonance, uh, there is a, introducing a new fraction of the microwave, which is then reflected from the wire grid and send it to the mixer. Uh, by this way, we are actually sensitive only to the, the signal from the sample. But it's of course, it's not perfect, especially when you're working with such a high power as is FEL, as, as FEL can provide, and there is more leakage. And this leakage is enough to actually destroy our detector. So therefore, we also need an, an, another silicon switch, which is also activated. And this gives us like that time and we, we can like we start measuring like literally after some time and all the power dissipate and we can see just the signal. Uh, yep, and so this is the spectrometer. It's using the sample holder, like simple sample holder where we can measure crystalline powder or liquid samples. And in the past, there were demonstration uh, of the T2 experiment with FEL, EPR measurement and T2 echo detection. And also like, uh, because we sending them such a narrow band with pulse, we can actually excite almost one gigahertz of spectra in the same time. So, and here's example of the Fourier transformer FEO EPR measurement on the P1 diamond. So this is all spectrometer. Uh, it's working, which is uh, great. And to be honest, there is so many components. So from my opinion, it's like almost like engineering masterpiece that is like capable to work relatively well. But there are like some key uh, issues with this spectrometer. One of them, it's only log on one frequency at 240 gigahertz. Another one, uh, the solid state source, which we normally using for normal EPR, like continuous wave EPR or rapid scan EPR or even pulse EPR. When you want to change the mode from the using the solid state source to use FEL as the source of the power, you have to literally move this source uh, for the injection locking, which is not so nice. We have to move big hardware changes. So we want to avoid it uh, in the R. Next iteration. Also, the pulse slicer gives us only two pulses, which are very limited. If you want to measure T1 echo measurement, we cannot do that. So therefore, we we want to like like address these issues, and we came with this new frequency agile uh, FEL spectrometer. We try to address this issue. We can suddenly we can now we should be able to tune the frequency from 170 to 500 gigahertz. Also, we have Krausen free magnet before it was a uh, uh, wet magnet. So now we can with collagen free and collagen free insert for the sample go up down to 1.8 Kelvin and the magnetic field up to 16 Tesla. And in this particular spectrometer, we can work, work in both regime in the FEL or solid state in the same time. I will now focus mostly on the three parts new uh, injection locking system and new quasi optic design for this system, what I, I did. Then the pulse slicer and quasi optical sample holder. So let's take a look on the first new quasi optical system. So how our quasi optics, as I told you, should work on the much wider range. So most of the can as much component as is possible should be frequency independent, or should work in this frequency range. Also, we want to increase a number of pulses from two to three, and uh, yeah, and we want to be able to operate in FEL mode as previously. So that means that we want to seed uh, FEL by low power microwave source. So this is like here is small schematic, the microwave source going through adjustable grid, then isolation to not get it burned by back reflection and coupled to FEL transfer line. When FEL start lasing, is going 
to the pulse slicer and then to the sample. And now, as you can see, there is two adjustable grid here and here. And in, in current design, if we adjust this adjustable wire grid, we can either work a field microwave source or we can adjust it in the way that we suddenly can work in low power source. So in this way, we can work in continuous wave to continuous wave EPR or rapid scan EPR or also pulse EPR. But additionally, uh, you can adjust these two wire grid in the way that we can also combine these two options. Of course, we will lose some power of both systems, so it's not ideal. 9 dB for FEL and 6 dB for low power source is the calculated uh, expected losses, but it gives us opportunity to do any combination what you see here. You can do one pulse of FEL and rapid scan. You can do like uh, one pulse with FEL, which also seeded with low, marks, low micro flash source, but because we will have AWG, we can then add, do other pulses uh, on different frequencies. So we can do pump and probe experiment. So later it gives us a lot of uh, like new possibilities. Yeah, I forget to switch the slide. Uh, but yeah, there's still some way to go and we need to like develop this pulse slicer, for example, which give us three pulses and we already did it. So, and for that, we actually uh, create from the scratch new pulse slicer, still based on the silicon switches. It was idea of my colleague Nick Aglenze. And in this setup, before we all the microwave go in one plane with the magnet, uh, with the optical table. In this, we are going 3D. And I will try to now explain it and I hopefully you will get it because it's not so easy to explain. So we have uh, input of the FER here. This is the spin line. Here is the time diagram. Uh, we have your input. In total, in one pulse size module, there are uh, eight parabolic mirror, two silicon switches and two lasers. Now we, we can use much low power lasers to activate the silicon. And so let's speak about how it's working. So it's the input long pass from FEO. If it's sent it to the input, and we are now, we are do not activate the silicon, so we can ignore all other colors except pink, because the microwave is passing through all four parabolic mirrors and getting out from the pulse slicer as the subtract at the subtractive channel without any change. Now we want to create a pulse. So what we are doing, we, we activate first silicon. When we activate it, we refoc or like we redirect, redirect the beam from the pink to the blue. So the pink is a new, the blue now. When it's crossing again to parabolic mirror, because we want to keep divergency hmm, under the control, it's passing the second second wafer. This is not activated yet. So if you see on the uh, time diagram, we have the sharp edge at the at the front, and then it's passing to our system. And now we want to want to also make the second pass uh, like turn off. And this we are doing by activating second silicon but second laser. By this we're creating a nice sharp pulse. But because like then we activate it and blue line is again here, what happening that the rest of the beam going back to the subtractive channel. So in this pulse slicer setup, we have nice pulse in one channel and the rest of it in the sec second channel. And the beauty of it is that uh, now the pulse length is also uh, determined by the delay between activation by these two lasers. So no optical delay line. And we show on the experiment that we can go up to like uh, one nanosecond pulse to create up to one nanosecond pulse with this laser. But there we are most likely limited by the rise time of laser because send the, uh, the laser pulse of our lasers now is around eight nanosecond. So yeah, and there's of course small downside, uh, which is like a property of the silicon because when we activate the silicon, the reflectance doesn't go to 100%, but go around to 80%, then it starts relaxing quite fast. But if you look on the here, uh, the reflectance of the silicon uh, diagram, we can see their inset. And this showing uh, the time scale of the FEL experiment. So in the time scale of FEL experiment, it actually doesn't matter so much. Yeah. And as I told you, uh, we have to rebuild it. So we start to do this design like from the scratch. And if we compare the new design of Pulse Slicer to the old design, the real picture, you can see that we drastically reduce the sizes up to 60 times. So now to build in with old setup, we can also do the free pulses, but we will have to build in the in the space quite a lot. But now you can see how, how small it is compared to the old one. And additional thing, because we always uh, keep 
uh, what is the rest of the beam in the system in this sub uh, subtractive channel, we actually can stack this module one to each other. So the setup what I showed you here are uh, the setup for creating one pulse. If you want to make two, we need uh, like two modules. And this we can easily do just couple next to each other. So this was successfully developed. We filed a patent and uh, now the, the article is under the review. So hopefully you can uh, you can read it some this article about this, this development. And let's take a look on the last part of my presentation, uh, which was the development of quasi-optical sample holder. Uh, so a little bit of uh, uh, introduction. So in high field EPR, people are typically not using the resonance cavity. The reason they are small. So we're working in uh, no cavity mode. And here, for example, the sample holder looks like here, like simple sample holder. Corrugative wave guide of EPR probe was connected to the body of the sample holder, where the, there was like modulation coil, and the mirror was placed on the functional part, uh, mirror with the sample. And the people here, the vari the sample position, where they putting on the middle sometimes, or they put in as close to the wave guide as possible, depends on the performance what they want. Because there's like two things happening there. If you put the sample with the mirror in the middle of the sample holder, because there is no waveguide, what's actually happening is clipping of the microwave. So microwave passing through the uh, microwave passing through the like corrugation waveguide, hit the mirror and going back uh, to the waveguide. But because of the divergency of the beam, is getting bigger and bigger, and when it's coupled to the uh, corrugation waveguide, corrugation horn, uh, there is clipping of microwaves, which result in losses of microwave. So you don't want to do that. You can put it uh, as close as to the output of corrugative waveguide as possible. You don't have to worry about it, but um, then you have to worry about the efficiency of your modulation coil, which in some exper experiment can be crucial. Because if you look here on the graph, this is like how much Gauss Modulation coil you can get per like milliamp, and you can see that if you put it a uh, sample closer to the corrugation wave guide because a lot of metallic surface is there, and also you are at the edge of the modulation coil, the efficiency of modulation coil decreases significantly. Also, in this sample holder, there is no control of the B1 field. Uh, because we aren't using the resonator, we care to put the sample on the metallic surface, on the metallic mirror. The reason is that we assume that there is a knot of the B1. Uh, field of electromagnetic wave which coming there. And this is what interact in the EPR with the sample we are looking for. But there are cases where you cannot put it directly on the mirror. You can have sample in your capillary, some basket, and suddenly uh, this can play a crucial role because suddenly you don't have not of B1, maximum B1 on your sample, but it will be on the mirror, but a sample is above it. And you your your sense will suffer again. And no control of induction mode that will speak later. And this is sample of what uh, I came from. Like first version of it pretty printed. So, and I will try now explain how it works. So it has a Helmholtz modulation coil where the sample is always middle. Uh, there is two moving mechanism, the roof mirror and parabolic mirror here. So parabolic mirror is employed to keep the beam uh, in the like in the in the free space. So no clipping should occur. So there's always some small clipping, but should uh, minimize that. And the sample is middle of the modulation coil, so there should be much better performance modulation coil, which is. Also, there is the side access to the sample because of hemon coils. Uh, and we can, for example, use an optical fiber to uh, act, like activate some sample or make fast exchange of samples and better isolation of reduction mode through this roof mirror, which I will speak later. So there are these two mechanisms of movement. So let's take a look on how they work. First is sample positioning. Uh, this is like, just spool gear where the pinion uh, rotate the huge gear which has thread in the middle. And then sample is placed on the malar field on the shaft, which is also thread. And this working like the nut and the uh, bolt. So because the bolt cannot move, when you rotate the nut, it can move only up and down. So by rotating the pinion, you're actually moving sample up and down with 30 microsecond step. And if we do like this small like stepping, like uh, I think this is 60 micron step, uh, we can see that from the worst position, what we like measure here to best one is almost like signal to noise ratio improve almost 30 times from 15 to 371, which is like significant and is like crucial for very, for example, thin samples uh, in, in 
flat, uh, flat cell capillaries. And second rotation is uh, is for the roof mirror. So now you can see here, this is like employee the worm gear, because now the worm gear is main reason is to get much higher uh, step resolution. So we're speaking about 0 0.01 sub degree step. And how is that working? The roof mirror is that when you have input polarization, it's rotated this input polarization by two alpha or one uh, two alpha and alpha is angle best between the input polarization to the roof axis, uh, roof mirror axis. And what is that does is that when you have this uh, induction mode and this linear polarized light passing through the vibrate and reflected back, so normally you go uh, it should go back to the sample. Uh, sorry, back to the detector. This this uh, polarization. So the the red one is coming back as the blue. So this we call copper. And the signal should be only cross polar, which is here the yellow, which is like 90 degree. In the ideal case, it's like different from the input polarization by 90 degree. With this root mirror, what we can do, we can rotate between when we have now no sample, we can actually change the polarization from copper to cross polar. And this is nice, you know, but why we want to use it? Because we can actually improve the induction mode. If you look again on our setup, uh, I have here the attenuation as a function of the noise because an IF, in our IF stage, we have amplifier, which is which working best when it has input power of certain level. And in, in front of it, there is the variable attenuator, uh, which we like control this uh, power that we put in there. In normal case, we operating around 25 dB, and you can see there is like most of the noise is created by this like attenuation, so there is, we don't see any, any noise coming out. So there is like no uh, no noise coming out from the amplifier, which is not so good because we know that lots of noise coming from this attenuator. And this is like how it looks continuous wave EPR spectra. Then we employ the roof mirror and we adjust it in the way to get the best isolation. Uh, so we adjust in the way that we get less uh, leakage from the like uh, source to the detector. And we actually looking only for the signal, we get 20 dB additional isolation. So our signal to noise ratio improves significantly. Let's take a compare how it's actually working. So we have this simple sample holder and signal to noise comparison uh, on our table. So now I will compare like four, four cases. First, our sample is in the middle of the modulation coil. Uh, this is like signal to noise ratio because uh, we doing continuous wave EPR, pulse EPR, and rapid scale EPR. If we play the sample close to the corrugation waveguide, there is no clipping. So signal to noise ratio is improved for continuous wave EPR, but we keep always the same amplitude of modulation, but also for pulse EPR. But there is no rapid scan EPR because the reason is that the modulation amplitude is not enough, sufficient enough, because we're doing rapid scan in field domain. So we need to sweep the, uh, the modulation over the whole spectra. And it's not working. It's, there is not enough uh, amplitude. Now, if we switch to quasi optical sample holder, just now there is no roof mirror, but we replace the roof mirror by flat mirror. We can see already that uh, the signal to noise ratio improved to compare to the sample in the middle in simple sample holder, but not so much uh, compared to the uh, sample close to the corrosive gauge waveguide. But we can still see the rapid scan. The reason probably is that uh, there is still, it's freely printed, the sample holder, so there is still some clipping, some other like microwave losses. But when we also apply the roof mirror and adjust it in the way that we improve the isolation, we can see that suddenly we got the best signal to noise ratio in all three EPR modes. That also means that when we use our sample holder, we don't have to change the sample position in the sample holder to get the best performance. We can do all the three modes in the same time. And in rapid scan, you can see that uh, it increased the signal to noise ratio significantly. We're speaking about six times better signal to noise ratio just by Free, free print like small sample order. And it is also some other effort. One will be for our FEL EPR. Because like in FEL EPR, when we create the pulses, this is the red, uh, we have to wait some time. As I told you, there is an activation switch, like protection switch for our detector before we start measurement. This is mostly because this there is this leakage from induction mode and this can burn the detector. Now we did this measurement with all power source. And what we're doing, we're sending there one long pulse and detecting it, its response. Now we use the simple sample holder with the sample on the top, closest to creative waveguide, and do the field sweep of this pulse. So we really can see that most of the signal is actually consumed with copper. So there is like a leakage of, from the like source, and when the resonance is happening, there is the small dips. 
if we apply the cost optical sample holder with roof mirror and we adjust it in the way that we have almost no leakage, we can actually suddenly see that the baseline change is almost zero. And we can see nice, uh, is I would say it's zero. And we can see nice uh, signal. So we actually operate in close to the ideal induction mode. And now the last slide is also, as I told you, it gives us six times better rapid scan performance. And what is uh, what is, is good for, like my colleague, Brad DePrice, uh, he developed 240 gigahertz fields uh, domain rapid scan in our spectrometer, but he was struggling with resolution, with time resolution. And this actually sample holder improved time resolution significantly. And we demonstrated by change uh, by measuring LIPC crystal, and we changed the atmosphere. We changed, we have LIPC crystal in the cryostat, we have the nitrogen uh, atmosphere, and then change to oxygen. When the oxygen go, uh, uh, is absorbed by the crystal because oxygen is very fast relaxation, the line with getting broader. You cannot see so great here, but my colleague actually also uh, record this nice movie. And when you can see uh, how it's getting broader when we change the atmosphere. And we can, this one is a measure, of course, like not with 15 millisecond time scale, because we're speaking about like whole, uh, whole effect happen in 100 seconds, but it's still working. And that's all. So uh, on the summary, I would like to thank you for uh, like to tell you that I told you about something about development of new generation of FER EPR and uh, about the class optical sample holder, which was recently published in Science Advance and you can read it here, or uh, and modular uh, pulse slicer, which is uh, under the review now. And we expecting the delivery of the magnet in February 2024. So we are open for collaboration if any would have something interesting to measure we are uh, we will be happy to hear from it so here is my contact so thank you for attention all right thank you anthony for this uh, uh for this talk it's very exciting development uh, and uh, yeah now we are open for questions so um i suggest that whoever has question can unmute uh, himself or herself and uh, and ask a question. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Um, very nice talk. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, especially the oximetry measurements is what my question uh, stems from. How did you control the atmosphere? Um, in oh. your plot, it just looks like you did nitrogen and then maybe switch to air. But do you have yeah, any sort did. of calculation of how much oxygen was going in no no this was like this uh demonstration so what we did we we literally pump uh nitrogen to the we have like in all setup we have flow crash stuff so we mm -hmm. build like small transfer light we pump there like nitrogen and then switch to oxygen so we did not do any any like uh, calculation of it because this was more like demonstration what is capable mm -hmm. to do but because it's not aim like my colleague this Bradley Price working with the light activation uh, of the uh, protein when it's like played the roles like more to be determined but here it was not so it was like we, we didn't control it we just have the two pipes in the lab oxygen and nitrogen pipes and we connected to the cryostat and we were able to switch it from one to second we always wait oh, okay. uh, sufficient time when we see that after five minutes the line with uh, stop like getting narrower. So we thought, okay, this is probably, probably enough and then we switched lines. Okay, mm -hmm. very cool. Um, and have you, do you intend to publish these results? Are they in the paper already? Yeah, they are in the paper. Uh -huh. They are in the science okay. events. Cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. F fascinating result, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um... I have a question actually. Uh, can you comment a bit on the um, on the sample sizes and sample holder that you can uh, can fit in your quasi optical? Um, yeah. Uh, so setup. So so far, like in our quasi optical, uh, they are in the scale. So we normally putting their uh, capillary, which is roughly six millimeter long. So we speaking that we are like. In the cross optical sample holder, I think there is like ten, uh, like eight millimeter in diameter, uh, space for the sample which can be fit there, and uh, so far we measure we put there the crystal because like uh this malar foil is like uh 
stretch, so it's pretty narrow. So we are able to measure the crystal just placing there, putting on like small appears on grease. Uh, the press powder part we didn't measure, but we measured a few powder uh, and mostly this liquid in capillary we measure. Right. Are there other questions from? Uh... Um, um, can I can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. In the pulsed EPR diamond signal, why do you get three peaks? Is it from nitrogen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen vacancies. Oh, nitrogen mm -hmm. vacancies. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, is, this... this technique is only for solid state EPR, or is it for I mean, uh, even room temperature liquid samples we can do it. Yeah, we, we actually, uh, yeah, maybe I, I, I forget to comment it. Uh, this, uh, we have this free measurement and it was done with three different samples. So this continuous wave was actually from the liquid. The liquid is sealed in small capillary. So this is liquid and uh, uh, here we measure, uh, of course, I, I just get, uh, yeah, gadolinium uh, dissolved in D2O. So this was measured by continuous wave EPR. Uh, diamond is just a really big piece of the crystal. And uh, rapid scan is like small crystal, like uh, a needle. So, but yeah, we can definitely measure the liquids here. There is no problem with that. Oh. We even like in the past, they measure also liquid in the bucket. So they have also like, I never did it because we find out the capillary is much easier to handle, but they did in the past that put the bucket of the solution to the sample. Mm -hmm. So if it's a liquid state, man, how much volume can we use? Uh, so yeah. So the, our capillary measure, I think we have 1 point uh, microliters. We speak about like around one microliter we speaking about. Oh, yeah. thank you, thank you. But EPR is super sensitive, especially on the high field. So it's way enough, you know. Yes. So now my another question is, how much scan width we can go, maximum scan width? Uh, maximum scan width, uh, now you're speaking about, because like the thing is that we have a field domain magnet, so if you want to sweep very slowly, uh, you can go up to 12.5 Tesla with the new system up to 16 Tesla. And if we are speaking about rapid scan, when you field domain rapid scan, so now we have a 100 Gauss scan width, mm -hmm. but we actually we working with on the development of this with, for the new coil, so we we expect to get higher. Not much higher because our samples are typically very narrow. But yeah, so far we have 100 gauss. Oh, okay, so in that case, we can go up to nitroxides maximum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go over some metal complexes or something, then we need a wider scan. Yeah, that, 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 that you go with the fields. Yeah, that you go with uh, main magnet of main coil of the magnet. You can yeah. sweep there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right, Yuji, go ahead. Hi, uh, that's a very nice talk. I also have a question about the sample uh, itself. You mentioned you did some liquid state uh, experiments. So is there any requirement for the sample, how lousy it can be and, and so on? I, I guess the question is similar to the, the one about yeah. the sample. So volume. this is a good question, like and here because like, it's literally, it's what we measure is like flat cell. And so the, I, it's written in the article, I don't remember now, like what is the, what is the height of the liquid in the this cell? But it's very like small, but it's very depends on your liquid, how, how much dielectric loss they have, right? Because like, if you yeah. example, measure the water, that can be a problem. But so far I measure with this uh, flat cell, also the water, uh, uh, I measure the tempo dissolved in water with a, uh, 0 0.1, 0 .1, uh, millimolar, uh, 0 0.1 uh, molar uh, concentration, and it was no problem so far. Okay. Also, like, so, so do you just uh, contain it in, or, or is, I may understand, right? It's uh, just it's, a drop it's, of liquid, or? No, no, it's, it's like, you can, you can, you can, um, you can image it like, uh, it's like really a capillary, capillary, but it's not like with the round shape of uh, insert, but it's like the okay. rectangle shape. So it's it's called like flat cell. And this is like, you can, it's like two glasses. We put the drop and you put two glasses together. All you, right, can, okay. you can buy yeah. it from the Sigma Algri, this, this flat cell, which yeah. is like, mm -hmm. like you cut it to the certain length 
you put there the liquid inside and then you seal it from both sides we use the wax you know so yeah. we have a candle in yeah. the lab and we seal it with the wax yeah yeah great uh, and i also have another uh, question about the epr spectrum you record using the uh, long pulse using induction mm -hmm. mode detection so how can you get rid of the leakage from the pulse itself oh that's the thing that uh uh with this uh roof mirror here what is doing you know uh let's say we we operate this is like just now we changing the polarization and where yep. you have the, in the system there is in idle induction mode all the input polarization from your source if they are not influenced by the sample it should pass it right for the wire so there should be no leakage but yep. there is the wire grid has typically 30 db 20 db isolation so there is always small fraction which going there we find out with this roof mirror, we actually improve this induction mode by additional 20 to 30 dB. So actually, yeah. there is like small change operation we found out is introduced either in EPR probe, in the coupling or by sample holder. And we can fix it with this uh, roof mirror. So when there is like slightly copolar, we can put it to the zero. So sorry, yeah, slightly co cross polar from the like from the source. We can literally put it to the zero that we cannot even see it with the detector. So this is how you that you can perfectly compensate. Yeah, uh, the it's, off, it's, by it's still not the... idea. As I told you, this is like a 3D printed sample holder. We aim to have for the new spectrometer machine it because we also want to work on the low temperature. Uh, this one so far work on the room temperature. It should work also nitrogen, but we never tested. But yeah, this is the way. So you're adjusting the room here in the way that you minimize uh, leakage from your source. So you are out of the resonance. You are not measuring the signal yet. You're just sending there your pulse. And you're just adjusting there is the knob on the top in our setup now. We also have undergrad to automize that with the stepper motor. And you're going and look, take a look at what is the leakage going to your detector. You have to be careful because with this, you can actually blow up your detector. You can, you can, what can happen? You can send there more power uh, than your detector can handle yeah. because you actually change yeah. it, but you can also adjust it. And we find out, yeah. I put it here value, I think 20 dB, but we can literally get even better. Like this was like kind of, I want to like stay like on the floor. But yeah, we can get even better. So yep. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you also for the question. All right. Are there any more questions from the audience? Doesn't look like. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, Anthony, for this uh, for this very nice talk. Very exciting development. And thank everybody for tuning in. The next um, seminar, I think, is in a couple of weeks. And uh, the next speaker, two weeks, yeah. And uh, and uh, the next speaker is John Morton, I guess, from UCL. So thanks, everybody. And uh, let's close the session here. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.